Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Laurie Roche. I am uh, one of the on the board of directors of the Friends of the DAO. We're really happy to have everybody here um, tonight, and we have uh, we have a few um, uh, initial announcements and things that we'd like to talk to, and then we'll get into our well. Then we'll get into our program for the uh, for the night. Um, we hope that you get a chance to go outside a little bit. I have not been out in the last 15 or 20 minutes, but it was supposed to be a little bit clear tonight. So maybe people can get to uh, go out a little bit later and see if they can see the comment. Um, we'd like to acknowledge that uh, we are on the lands or is it the Friends of the DAO and the Center of the Universe and the yes. Telescope at the DAO is on the lands of the uh, Wasanic uh, people, uh, Senchothan speaking people of the Wasanic um, uh, territory, and that we are able to uh, be there and to work and to play. We are very appreciative and honored to be able to be on their territory, and that we are up on a hill that is called Watixis, um, and uh, that we should be um, very, very soon. Um, working to have a, a collaborative um, work done with the Wasanic uh, Nation um, on in signage and in work um, that is going to be up on the hill. So um, hopefully we'll see that soon. So um, thank you to them. Um, we would like to just talk a little bit about our um, our the road <laughs> and why we are still not having things up on the hill. Uh, the uh, as some of you already know, the construction um, started on the hill in late uh, in in late um, well, October, early November, and uh, there was some um, some added problems that added a little bit of time um, to the work of the construction, and um, so in the at, at the beginning of December, uh, we had to make the decision to close the hill to the public, absolutely for the safety of everybody that was involved, um, and the safety for our volunteers, for the public coming up, um, for the staff, we had to make those decisions. We are really hoping that we might be able to be open, I mean, as early as the February, uh, the February star party, but we're not going to guarantee that. Uh, might be March by the time we get uh, we get back up. And we have um, been doing some school programs that we have done a little bit of pivoting back again to be in the classrooms rather than to have this, the students back up on the hill. So lots of different things kind of going. We are still we are still here. We're still working really hard to get things um, to get things going. And we hope that um, uh, all of our patients can be rewarded just in a little while once we get the um, once we get the hill back open again and everybody can come back up so in february on the on the 25th of february our next star party is going to um uh uh highlight um amy archer who you will see tonight in a couple of other in a couple of other ways and she is going to be giving us a talk uh, called north star to freedom and it's vignettes about the underground railway and the night sky. And I think that that will be really an interesting take on, um, on, on another way of looking at, uh, at the history of how the night sky was used. So we hope that you'll join in for that. Um, we're looking at possibly in March having an open house with some of the surrounding um, community uh, in order to uh, to be, um, well, we thought it was going to be part of be a tourist in your own hometown, except that they are not doing that this year. They're not going to do it until 2024. So, uh, so we're just going to kind of go ahead and maybe do something on our own. And then in April, on April the 29th, I believe I've got the date correct, it's a Saturday, and that is International Astronomy Day. And so we'll be back uh, at the museum uh, in the daytime, doing a having a big program at the museum in conjunction with the Royal Astronomical Society. And then in the evening, we will be having a program up on the hill, and that will be our our official kind of um, start to the to the season again and to summer star parties. And we'll give you a little bit more information um, after that. So unless uh, one of the other people have got any other announcements that they'd like to put forward, I can tell you what we're going to be doing for the rest of the evening.
Um, uh, I've got to, Don, uh, Don Moffat is going to be doing a what's up in the sky and talking a little bit about that green thing that is supposed to be up there that we haven't been able to see very much because there hasn't been very good weather. Um, Calvin is going to be giving another section of the of the virtual tour. So he's already, he's showing parts of the virtual tour over the last two um, programs and he's going to be doing something on the spectrograph and Plaskett Star. And then we're going to have da -da 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 a game show with, uh, with uh, Astro Jeopardy and we've got some special guests and we're going to be talking about that a little bit. That will be from about 7.45 till about 8.15. And then at about 8.15 to 8.30, we're going to be having our famous Dan, um, uh, uh, Dan Posey, uh, Brock, um, and Dave Payne um, are going to be talking a little bit about some of the EAA or the ex electronically assisted, um, uh, um, oh, sorry, electronically assisted astronomy, I'm sorry, and showing some of the gorgeous pictures that some people have in the very small ports of time where we've been able to have been giving some pictures. So um, I'm going to turn it over right now to Dawn. Is Dawn available? Oh, James, did you I have a James question? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll take potent potables for $300. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Oh, sorry. We're not playing yet? No, no we're sorry. not playing yet. No, not okay. playing yet. Okay. Lower my hand. I'm going to give it back over to Dawn. Dawn, okay. where you go. Jumping the gun there. So, uh, so welcome to what's up, everybody, for January twenty eighth. And uh, I kind of like to generalize the title to what's up because we like to know what's up in the gift shop. And so I'm going to put Amy Archer on the spot right now and just ask <laughs> her what kind of new and or cool products we have in the gift shop. You are putting me on the spot. Um, well, uh, Valentine's Day is coming up and everybody's looking to buy a gift for, for someone. And we have um, we have some very uh, cute celestial buddies, but particularly we have some Venus buddies that have little hearts for lips and they'd be perfect for a gift for... Um, for someone's sweetheart. We also have a number of books that would also make a great gift. So if you go through our website, you can find our store. And, um, and if you're local to Victoria, we can drop something off for you. But if you're a little bit further afield, we'll happily put that in the mail. So um, yeah, through our website at the center of the universe.org, uh, you can find our store there. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Amy. And I'm going to uh, I've been asked to speak a little bit louder. I don't have a volume control on this that I can adjust, so I'll just try to adjust my internal volume here, and uh, we'll see if we can uh, do a little bit better. Is, is that a little bit better, Lori? Uh, a little. I don't. Maybe okay. it's just I'll, me. Um, I'll, I'll 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 try to shout as much okay. as I can here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to shout some uh, astronomical events at you at you all. So I'm uh, going to start out with just the the usual thing about sunset and twilight, and it's kind of interesting that i think some uh some people may find this a little bit boring but on the other hand i know an awful lot of people who seem to be obsessed with uh when it's when it starts to get lighter at the end of the day around this time of the year so i do like to just mention that and also gives us a little bit of hope for the <laughs> for the next month so so let's start out here so sunrise was at 7 47 a.m today with astronomical twilight beginning at just before 6 at 5 58 a.m and by the end of February, sunrise will be at 6.56 a.m., so getting quite a bit earlier. Uh, sunset was at 5.05 p.m. today, and astronomical twilight ended just before 7 at 6.54 p.m. And by the end of February, sunset will be at uh, 5.55 p.m., so a whole hour later, uh, or, or almost an hour later, I should say, about 50 minutes later. So. Uh, up until this month, the stars that we see at sunset have been relatively unchanged. And that's because uh, sunset was getting earlier as we were moving around the sun. And now, however, sunset is getting later. So when it starts to get dark, we'll notice a, there'll be a noticeable difference in the constellations. So we won't see Cygnus, for example, hanging over there in the western part of the sky. And and so, uh, but for now, we can still see some uh, familiar winter constellations. Orion is up in the evening, and uh, the Andromeda galaxy continues to be well placed. 
uh, up, up fairly high. And always, uh, for more information about sunrise and sunset, you can go to time and date and select Victoria for your location. And so the moon phase is first quarter tonight, and this is an excellent time to explore the craters and crags on the moon because the sunlight's coming in at a strong angle. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the moon phase in the context of the comet a little bit later. So full moon is on February 5th, and last quarter is on February 13th, and February 19th is the new moon. And as for the planets, Venus has been a very welcome sight low in the southwest just after sunset and notice how its position changes compared to saturn while saturn is still visible and you might not be able to see saturn anymore depending on what your horizon is like but uh, this is a bit of a challenge see maybe see the latest date at which you can see saturn it will be reappearing in the morning sky in uh, in sort of mid late spring and will be at opposition again in in august so it'll be at its uh, best placement in August. It has been fairly low down in the sky for the last few years when it's in the uh, when it's out of opposition, just because of where it is in the ecliptic. But uh, and so our, our view of the rings has been a little bit distorted by air turbulence and so on. But nevertheless, it's always uh, a welcome sight. So, uh, so it'll be really it'd be quite a treat to uh, watch Jupiter and Venus draw closer together over this month. And they'll be at their closest on March 1st. And so there'll be a nice, a nice pair on March 1st. And, uh, and at, on February, 20, uh, February 22nd, look for the moon and Jupiter close together and then Venus just off to the side a little bit. So that's going to be quite a spectacular sight. And for you astrophotographers out there, uh, like Dan Posey and others, uh, maybe you can give us some tips on how to, how to capture that later. I'm going to put you on the spot here, maybe... Uh, See if you can come up with some advice on that. And so Mars, of course, is continuing to be well placed in the evening sky. And so compare its color to uh, Betelgeuse and Aldebaran. And I'm just going to see if I can put uh, the night sky up here and just share a little bit. And uh, hopefully I can move some of you out of the way here. So this is uh, the current configuration of the nighttime sky just after sunset. And Saturn is down quite low, and then Venus, Jupiter, uh, the moon tonight, and then Mars. Okay, so I'm just going to just uh, stop sharing, hopefully. Let's see if we can have a try to avoid technical issues here. There we go. Okay, so there is a comet in the, in the news, and as many of you are aware, there's a comet called Comet ZTF, or C20, uh, 22E3, which is technical designation, and that's been in the in the news. And I would say, unfortunately, it probably shouldn't have been in the news because it's. Uh, and I don't think they can use the ex excuse of a, of a slow news day anymore for this kind of thing. But uh, nevertheless, it's been in the news, and uh, I noticed there's a lot of talk about how you know it hasn't been around in 50,000 years. Make sure you don't miss it, and so on. And so instead of ZTF, I think they should call it uh, Comet FMO or fear of missing out because uh, uh, I think they're generating a little bit of hype about this. But nevertheless, the name ZTF refers to it being detected by the Zwicky Transient Facility at Mount Palomar between Los Angeles and San Diego in Southern California and it was first detected last March. And this telescope is actually fairly interesting. Uh, Zwicky was an astronomer who was the first to uh, suggest the existence of dark matter in galaxy clusters in the mid 20th century. And the telescope involved dates to that era. It's the Palomar 48 inch telescope. So its aperture is the same aperture as the smaller professional telescope here uh, at the observatory at the DAO. So the significant thing about this telescope is that it can capture about 47 square degrees of sky in one shot. And that's, it's the largest area of sky that can be captured in one shot of any, any telescope that size or bigger. So it's really great for just, just seeing what's up there. And it can do this every two days and it does it in a variety of filters. And so uh, it'll take a shot of a big chunk of sky 
and then do a bunch of other spots and then come back and do that again in two days. And so if anything's moving up there, that's the tran uh, transient part. If anything's moving, it will often pick it up. And so it's a very efficient use of this old telescope. And for some of you out there, you might, be, you might know that it's uh, the same telescope that produced the Polymer Sky Survey back in the mid 20th century as well. And uh, so, uh, so again, uh, as for this comet being unusual, the orbital period nor the color are really unusual. Uh, this is uh, not a comet, and actually this is not a comet most people will find unless they're already accustomed to looking for objects in the night sky with the aid of binoculars or telescope. And the true great comets, as they're called, uh, comets that are easily seen by people who are not amateur astronomers are typically a hundred times brighter than this comet, and the tails are typically visible to the unaided eye. And this one is currently um, is uh, around sixth magnitude, so it's it's right on the edge of what you would be able to detect with your eye under ideal conditions. So, nevertheless, um, I'm not going to try to discourage you too much from trying to find it. It's possible to find over the next next week or so, as long as you're attempting to find it from a relatively dark site and let your eyes adjust to the darkness for at least 20 minutes. And I should just put in the proviso, the moon is already at first quarter. So really the next day or two is probably the only chance to try to pick this thing up, um, even with binoculars because of the moon, moonlight increasing. And so, um, so why is the dark, the dark site so important? Because binoculars should be able to see stars that are on the edge of visibility. Well, the magnitude of the comet is actually its total magnitude of its glow. And these things are kind of like little fuzzy cotton balls. And so if there's any loss of contrast with the sky, they're really, really hard to see. And, uh, and so uh, as for the greenish color, you'll likely need to have like a six inch telescope or larger in order to see that color because uh, your eye needs to have lots of light in order to see color as well. And I'm just going to try to share my screen again and attempt to show you where it is tonight. And I did go out and, and try to find it and em emphasize try to find it. And uh, I'm just going to adjust the time here a little bit and uh, just adjust a few other things. So pardon me while I just fumble around a little bit here and hopefully get us in the right part of the sky. And oops. And I'm just going to take away the sky a little bit here. And let me see if I can move this around to the right spot. And uh, I'm going to put the constellations in to help me a little bit. It's actually near, there we go. Helps to have the constellations in there, doesn't it? So there's the bowl of the Little Dipper. And the comet is right about where that little cross here was. I'm just going to zoom in. Hopefully this will work. And it's near the star called Kochab here, which is the brightest star in the bowl of the, the Little Dipper. And I'm just going to zoom in a little bit more. And so what we're actually looking for is uh, it, what you try to do is kind of line up these two stars in the bowl of the Little Dipper and you'll star hop over to this star right here and then go at a right angle over to this fainter star and this fainter star is about as faint as the uh the, the faintest star that you can see with your eye under ideal conditions it's about six magnitude so that's about the bright the total brightness of the comet and the comet will be over in this area approximately so good luck it's not going to be easy to find I did go out and try to find it, but uh, for best results, uh, try to uh, let your eyes dark adapt for about 20 minutes. So no cheating by looking at your phone or anything like that. Make sure you don't do that, but um, see if you can find it. And if you do, please let us know. So that's about it. Uh, I don't know if anybody has actually been successful at seeing the comet. Um, it, please uh, speak up if you have, or if you've even tried. Uh, Laurie, have you? tried to see it or I went out oh sorry I went out uh a, what a, maybe about 
like 10 days ago, 12 days ago on a, on one time and I couldn't find it. My, my eyes are not very good anymore, so I'm not able to see it. But I just wanted to let people know that the uh, uh, UVic Observatory, the, the students are opening the UVic Observatory tonight um, oh, up, at the, up at the, up on, up at, at UVic and that they were going to try to see whether they could find it. So they've got a nice big telescope there and would be able to find it. So after we're finished here, if you want to run over to the, to the, yeah. uh, to, to UVic, they might be um, able to show you. So how, how late are they open? Do you know? Until 10 o'clock tonight. Until 10 o'clock. Yeah. And one other thing about the <coughs> seeing this is that we're actually looking fairly low down in the sky and looking through a bit of haze and, uh, and uh, and light pollution as well. So all of those things do uh, cause a lot of issues with trying to see these faint fuse objects. But uh, maybe they'll uh, be able to show it to you up at UVic. So that's that's great. Thanks very much, Laurie. And uh, have fun tonight, everybody. Good luck in the contest. So Don, I thought I saw it in Stellarium, but it was just a smudge on my screen. <laughs> so. Uh, just I wrote, I had uh, Chat GPT write us a little haiku about the night sky. Maybe we could end the, this session with that uh, haiku. Sure thing, Star go for it. Stars in the sky, shining bright like diamond dust, guiding us through night. That's beautiful. <laughs> Kind of scary that it has to be done through AI, right? <laughs> well, I'm no, no, it poet. doesn't have to. <laughs> Yo, no maybe poet. it does. <laughs> All right. Back to, you. Uh, back to uh, me, I suppose, or to me first. Um, hello. So I believe uh, I am next. I am doing a, um, a continuation of the virtual tour. Uh, so the last time I uh, was doing, I was actually, I was doing the virtual tour and I pretty well did a quick look through the virtual tour that you can find at uh, our website, center of the universe.org. I showed the mirror that used to be in the telescope, the original mirror. I showed the model. Um, then another time I showed the uh, dome itself. Uh, so I figured this time around, I would uh, look into something in a little bit more detail um, the way I would if uh, I was taking a tour and I had a, a lot of uh, extra time to go into something. So uh, this time around, I will uh, share my screen here. It might take a second. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the spectrograph uh, that is on the Plasquet telescope. All right, so uh, here's an old photograph of the Plasquet telescope, and I'll tell you a little bit about how this telescope works. Uh, so uh, this telescope has a big mirror called the primary mirror way at the the back here and this is what does all of the light collecting and that's really important because the bigger the mirror you have the more light you can collect and you can make very dim objects look much brighter and i will talk about this device here at the bottom called the spectrograph uh, so that is um would be located at what is called the focal point so uh, this is a diagram here of the telescope uh, this is uh, where the you can see the primary mirror here, and there's actually a secondary mirror, which on the photograph on the left would be up near the top. Uh, when this is looking at a star, the light from the star comes uh, down and through the tube of the telescope, and it gets to the mirror. And the mirror is curved, so instead of reflecting light right back, it actually reflects at an angle. And if you follow these dashed lines in the diagram, you'll see it hits the secondary mirror, and they eventually converge once they pass through a hole in the primary mirror to the focal point. So that would be the, a great place to put uh, an eyepiece to look through or a camera to take a picture. And in the case of the Plasquet telescope, there is a spectrograph. So a spectrograph 
is uh, basically putting a prism where you've done, you may have done that experiment where there's white light going through a prism and it spreads out into a whole rainbow of colors. That's spectroscopy. That's what a spectrograph does. Uh, this can be uh, used to learn a lot of different things uh, about uh, stars or any other objects in the sky, but I'll focus on one for this uh, short little presentation here. Uh, so if you did look at a, a star you would uh, with this, you would see a whole rainbow of colors. And I believe the next slide should have a like a diagram, a picture of one. This is just a pretend one. So um, if you looked at a star, uh, you would see a whole spectrum, but then you would see some of the uh, light uh, being blocked by different elements that would be in the atmosphere of the star. Uh, so in this case, in this example, this is hydrogen. So we see almost a whole rainbow, except there are very specific colors of light that are blocked by the hydrogen. And the uh, light is a wave, so it, each color has a wavelength associated with that. So uh, when you're looking at a star and you do see these lines, that would indicate that you're looking at hydrogen. So the hydrogen will always create uh, this very specific pattern of, uh, of lines in this. And uh, what's really interesting, though, is if you happen to see this exact same pattern, but shifted slightly, then that would indicate that the object is moving toward or away from you. which means you can measure uh, speed. So this is the exact same effect as the uh, Doppler effect. It, it is the Doppler effect, but just for light. So uh, for sound, we may be a little bit more familiar with that. Uh, if there's some really loud, really loud object moving towards you, well, that would mean that the wavelength of the sound waves are getting compressed and smaller, and that would lead to higher frequency of sound. And if it's moving away from you, it would have longer wavelengths of sound, and that would mean it's a lower pitch, lower frequency. Uh, so in the case for light, the Doppler shift, uh, it would mean that the, uh, the larger wavelengths uh, are red. So if, some, if this pattern of colors, uh, pattern of lines is shifted to the red, then that would mean that the object, like a star or something in outer space, is moving away from us. And if it's shifted uh, blue, that would mean that it's moving toward us. So uh, astronomers can do this. They can look at where uh, exactly where this pattern of lines should be by, say, in a laboratory looking at hydrogen gas, they would find lines in a very specific place. And then they can look at different objects in outer space and they can see those patterns shifted slightly and they can measure the difference in like millimeters of wavelength and they can measure how fast an object is moving, either toward or away from us. Uh, oh yeah, right. And uh, if the um, the spectral lines happen to be shifting red and then blue and then red and then blue back and forth, that would mean that there, you're, what you're looking at is two stars that are orbiting each other. So this is what we call a binary star system. So at one point, uh, one star is moving toward us and then, and uh, the other star is moving away. And uh, then it will be uh, trading places as they move around. So uh, John Stanley Plaskett uh, was doing this kind of research, looking for stars that appear to be, um, that appear to be, uh, just one star because the stars are so far away that they might look like one star. And he's searched through a bunch of different stars and used this technique to discern if some stars were actually two that were orbiting each other. So um, uh, Plaskett did that for many stars. Uh, one of the uh, exciting ones, though, was in 1922 uh, using the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory's spectro spectrograph. And he found uh, two uh, very big stars 
uh, that were uh, spinning around each other really quickly. Um, so using this uh, Doppler shift method, um, found that these stars, uh, which are is now called Plaskett star, they are two stars, and uh, they orbit each other every 14.4 days. Um, and that's really, really fast, considering uh, it takes the Earth one year to go around the sun. Uh, this is two very big objects spinning around. How big? Well, they each weigh more than 50 suns. Uh, so these are incredibly large, large stars that are spinning around. And I believe it's they're like 5,000 light years away from us. And uh, if we tried to look at them, um, they wouldn't appear too bright um, to us. We'd probably need a, uh, some kind of telescope to be able to even see them. Um, but they are very large objects moving really fast. Um yeah, pretty pretty fantastic. So I just wanted to share um, that little uh, piece of uh, history and science. Alvin, it's uh, they're eight thousand two hundred light years away. Thank you for that uh, correction. Eight thousand two hundred light light years it, away from us in the constellation Monoceros. Yes, right. Uh, Mon Monoceros. Yeah, Monoceros is like the name of the. Yeah. <laughs> um, excellent. Yeah. So um, these stars are what uh, what astronomers call like O type stars. So they they are extremely bright and they're bluer in color. Uh, and there's two of them. Um, however, they're so far away that I think they're like sixth magnitude. So they're like not noticeable to human eyes. But a simple telescope would maybe pick them out just barely. <laughs> but you would need a spectrograph to even see that there's two. Uh, so that's all I had uh, prepared for uh, us today for any kind of uh, virtual-ish tour. So, um, oh, I don't have the itinerary up. Well, I think, Calvin, we're going to go uh, from that, unless anybody oh, has any thank other you. questions. Uh, anybody, anybody has any other questions? Um, for Calvin, um, uh, we we do this kind of a program a little bit for grade tens and and grade elevens when we talk to them. We don't usually do too much with this when they're younger, but at about that level, then we um, then we can give those that kind of information. And it's always That's really right. interesting when you can put the the science part in with the history. Um, the pictures that he showed were of the original of the original spectrograph. Um, the spectrograph now actually looks a little bit different and uh, maybe one of That's the, right. James uh, or, uh, <laughs> or, or um, Dennis might want to talk about that a little bit later, but- I'll just, Can I just mention that oh, yes. um, in the 19th century, for example, astronomy, there was astronomers did astronomy and that was measuring the position of a star, its motion across the sky, timekeeping, and then they developed photography and they could take images of stars and get, you know, better positions, etc. It was the ability when they started taking spectra of the stars that then it became astrophysics. And that is why the it's called the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory. Plaskett was very adamant that it be called the Astrophysical Observatory because, damn it, we do astrophysics here. So... <laughs> Just to add one other thing to what Dennis said, in the 19th century, there were two kinds of objects in the sky, stars and nebula. Um, there and were... planets, planets. Oh, yeah, I, I forgot about the planets, but, but these sky objects, <laughs> um, e everything that wasn't a star was a nebula, meaning cloud of some kind or other. And they, were, they knew they were very different. There were different shapes of clouds, but they didn't know any of them were outside our galaxy. That wasn't discovered till the early 1920s. Right, everything was uh, either pointy or cloudy. Yeah. <laughs> it was some kind of cloud or other. Some of them were round, some of them were smudges, and some of them were diffuse, but they were all clouds. <laughs> All right, we're going to change over to Amy Archer. Amy, you are our hostess 
of the mostest. So I, 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 I am, I'm just an, an introducer. I'm just a voice. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so, uh, and I'm a very excited voice. I'm excited to have you guys all here for, for, um, for this game show. Uh, a very, a very good friend to the FDAO mentioned this at dinner um, a while back that we should try this. And I thought, Hey, <laughs> I'm game. Let's, let's see how this goes. So, um, so we have three contestants tonight. So our contestants for tonight's game show are uh, Dr. Ben Dorman, uh, who is our illustrious board chair. Ben uh, has been fascinated by the night sky since he was three years old, and he had a cousin who told him to just look up. Uh, then we also have with us Dan Posey, who is a member of the RASC Victoria chapter, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, sorry. He is an executive by day and an amateur astronomer and historian by night. Dan was uh, in an astronomy course when he was in university and heard a description of how to take photos of the night sky and he thought he could do that. And he has been hooked and very good at it ever since. <laughs> then we have um, another doctor, James DeFrancesco, who is the director of the, the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory always quick-witted and always keeping us smiling. James's favorite constellation is Perseus because it contains the vast cloud of star forming gas where he has made many of his discoveries. And then tonight, uh, very fortunate to have uh, Dennis Crabtree joining as our, oh no, I have something and everything went away. Okay, uh, to have Dennis Crabtree joining us as our game show host. Um, Dennis is the unofficial historian of the Dominion Astrophysical Observatory, and he uh, spends much time scanning photographs taken by um, John Stanley Plaskett um, between 1910 and 1914. So here is our group for today. I will be um, sharing my screen. Our, our contestants will be raise, using the little raise hand uh, icon in their Zoom uh, when they have an answer and we'll be looking to see who raises their uh, hand first. Uh, you'll get a clue and things need to be answered in the form of a question. Um, if you don't answer in the form of a question and you happen to get it right, somebody else is going to answer for you. Dennis will be keeping us in good humor and uh, keeping you guys honest here. So... <laughs> Yes. Okay. So welcome to Astro Jeopardy. Uh, as Amy explained, uh, you will pick a category at a dollar amount. Well, I don't see the dollar sign. You pick an amount and I will ask the question. And again, you will have to phrase your answer in the, in the sense of a question. If you get the answer right, you'll be get that amount of points. If you get the answer wrong, then those points will be deducted from your total. So um, let's see here. Let's, who can we, I guess we have to start with somebody. So I will flip my three-sided coin here and we will come up with, start with Dan Posey. So Dan, go ahead, pick your opening salvo. This might be my only shot. So uh, Astro History for 500, please. Astro History for 500. The Mayans wrote a book containing their early human attempts to make sense of the sky above us. This is the oldest surviving book in North America and was rediscovered in Dresden, Germany. Nobody has an answer? Okay. What is the Dresden Codex? Dresden Codex. Okay, I guess we will move on to Ben. We'll let you have a shot at it. All right, Amy is going to stump us all, I think, and the other two are going to make me... And these up. are the easy questions. Yeah, I realize that. Um, why don't I try stars for 300? Stars for 300. The largest known star... Uh, what is um, 
Oh. Oh, who, Amy, who raised her hand first? Okay, well, go with Ben. I, just I pick fell someone. down on my job here, sorry. <laughs> go with Ben. Um, yeah, it's UI something, isn't it? Yeah, sorry, I couldn't can't think of it. James. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Uh, uh, what is UI Canis Majoris? That is not the answer I have. Dan. The Pistol Star? Correct. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Dan gets to pick the next question. Uh, you can answer well, I... the next one a question. Oh, I didn't. No, uh, we're okay. We're going to let it slide for this for now. He kind of said it with an what? upwards inflection, right? He was kind of like pistol star. <laughs> yeah, it was a more of a what question. Is yeah. the pistol star? Uh, to be correct, um, uh, I don't know. Planets for three hundred, please. Planets for three hundred. This planet's craters are named after famous artists, musicians, and authors. Example: Rich Maninoff, Beethoven, Zhao Zhao, Zhao, Zhao and Tostoy. Dan. What is Mercury? Correct. Score is Ben zero. Dan is 600 and James zero. Dan, pick the next question. Uh, stars for 400, please. Stars for 400. These are two of the different dwarf planets in our solar system. Hold on. What? Dan. Stars for 400. Uh, what are series? Oh, Pluto? did I pick the wrong one? Yeah, you picked the wrong one. Sorry. The picture. Stars, not planets, right? You yeah, yeah, stars. yeah. Yeah, okay. Sorry. Stars. Two parts. What astronomical unit is defined as this length? So the Dan length? did have his hand up originally. It does it still. Oh, no, he took it down. Okay, so Ben is the person. And then the second part is the length above is approximately this many kilometers. What is the distance from the Earth to the Sun? And what is 1. 150 million kilometers? Correct. 149.6 million kilometers. Give or take. Mean distance, though. Mean distance. <laughs> we're, we're not mean here, Calvin. We're all kind people. That's approximately. <laughs> Okay, Ben, uh, hands down, please. Hands down, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, could I get um, not astronomy for 200? Not astronomy for 200. The, this metallic or plastic object is often added to the end of a hoodie string or shoelaces to keep the string from fraying. James. What is an eyelet? Uh, could you spell that, please? What? Uh, I think it's, well, I think it's E-Y-E-L-E-T. That is not the right answer that I have. Did, did somebody else have their hand up? Wow, you are mean. <laughs> yeah, you are mean. Dan. Yeah, what, what is a thingy? <laughs> How is a thingy? Nope. <laughs> The, I, the, I'm not. I'm not going out on this plank. The uh, the term is aglet. What is an aglet? A g l e t. <laughs> an eyelet is what you put this to put it through. Through. Yeah. It's not the thing at the end of the, the thingy at the end of the. So it's just a thingy. You're. I was right. Okay, so who was asking? Answer uh, Ben. So you ben. get to ask it, Ben. What. You get to ask the next question since oh, we got that one right. All right. Um, okay. What about astro history for 200? Astro history for 200. He is the person credited to first asserting that the Earth is spherical. Ben. Who is Aristophanes? Incorrect.
Dan. It was Plato? Incorrect. <sighs> James. Who is Aristarchus? Incorrect. <laughs> Who is oh. Pythagoras? Mm. I'm assuming he figured it out using triangles, but... <laughs> Okay, Ben, again. Me? All right. Somebody, yeah. What about deep space for 300? This is a cloud of predominantly icy planetesimals proposed to surround the sun of, at distances ranging from 2,000 to 200,000 AU. And I wasn't watching Amy, so you who had their hand raised first? Ben, was, ben had his hand raised first, and then James, and then Dan. What is the Oort cloud? Correct. Okay, Ben, ask, pick a, pick a question. I think I should give someone else a turn. No, no, you asked, you, 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 if you win, All you right, get... Well, I did okay on that one, so we'll have deep space again for 400 this time. This picture is a part of which nebula the it's called this this picture is of the pillars of creation is a part of which nebula that was james first uh, what is the eagle nebula correct james is on the board all right okay i'll take deep space for 200. this is a highly magnetized rotating compact star that emits Beams of electromagnetic radiation out of its uh, magnetic poles. And it Amy? Was, it was Dan. Dan, then James, then Ben. What is the magnetar? Incorrect. James? James? What is a pulsar? Correct. Magnetar is a type of pulsar. That's right. But... Technically, it's a neutron star, oh. not a okay. pulsar. A pulsar is a radio object that is oh. a neutron star. This is just, we're on nighttime TV. We're not going to get too scientific about this. <laughs> so, James, <laughs> each one is a subset. <laughs> I'll, take, I'll take not astronomy for 400, please. Alex. This organ is responsible to secreting insulin into the bloodstream. Dan, then Ben, then James. Pancreas? Do it in the form of a question, please. What is the pancreas? Correct. <clears throat> okay, pick a question, please. Uh, starts from 500, please. This is the constellation shown in the picture. Dan. And then Lyra? James. What is Lyra? Incorrect. Oh. James? What is Aries? Incorrect. The correct answer is cancer. Hmm. Okay, James, pick another question. Me? No, who, who asked was the it? last one? No, it was it was Dan. Dan. Dan, sorry, Dan. Ah, stars for 200, please. Among other elements, our sun is comprised of 71% duh and 26.5% blah. And that's Dan, Don, Ben, I mean, had his hand up first. What is hydrogen and helium? Correct. Okay, let's do planets for 500. This solar system houses seven Earth-sized planets in its habitable zone. James. It was James first. What is Trappist-1? Correct. Right. Okay, our current scores are Ben with 900, Dan with 1,000, and James with 1,100. Okay. What James. All right, I'll take uh, not astronomy for 300, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. 
This is the name of the 2011 iteration of the Shakespeare play Romeo and Juliet, depicting the main characters as garden gnomes. James has. What is Romeo and Juliet? Correct. <laughs> if anybody was going to know that, it would be you. <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> okay, uh, I'll take uh, Deep Space. Or 100, please. This is the theoretical boundary around a black hole beyond which no light or other radiation can escape. Ben was, ben, ben was quick on that. What is the event horizon? Correct. Okay, Ben, pick a question. All right, we'll have deep space for 500 then. This is the comet with the shortest orbital period. Ben. What is Ankis Comet? I'll take that. Just a question for Amy. Do we have a daily double or not? No, that's the one that comes up in the boxes, right? No. Okay, but we do have it in here. What? Nobody's picked it yet. Okay, well, anyways, uh, Ben, go ahead. Lower your hand, Ben. Yes, that's, it's not fair to have, keep your hand up and then... Um, Okay, but I'm not really all that fair. Um, could I get uh, planets 400? These are two different, are two of the dwarf planets in our solar system. I, I wasn't watching Amy who... Uh... Dan, then Ben, then James. Uh, what are Ceres and Pluto? What was the first word? Ceres and Pluto. Yes. That's correct. The other one was Eris. If you want two out of three, you was all you needed. Okay. Uh, wow, we have a tight game. Uh, planets for two hundred, please. This is the densest planet in our solar system. Dan, uh, what is Mercury? Incorrect. Oh, James. Uh. What is the Earth? Correct. Isn't it referring to its inhabitants? <laughs> uh, okay, I'll take not astronomy for 500, please. Gen 2, Chinstrap, and Adley are all species of this animal. Ooh. Ben. Me? What is a penguin? Yes, so I'll take that. What are penguins? Very good, Ben. Wow. This man knows his Thank penguins. You. <laughs> you were the Linux distros or something. I, I only I only knew one of them, actually. <laughs> okay, pick a question, Ben. All right, let me get Astro History for 300. These ancient Southeast Asian texts extensively studied astronomy among other fields of science and philosophy. No one? No one. Okay. What are the Vedas? Oh, okay. Never heard of them. Uh, Okay, Ben, pick a question. Again? All right. Well, since I did so badly on that, I'm going to try it again. As astro history for 400. The Chinese are the first civilization to record this event in 2136 BCE. Dan, Ben, James. Uh, a super observation of a supernova, but I think that it's uh, also 1136 BC. Incorrect. And remember to phrase your answer in terms of a question. James? What is a solar eclipse? Correct. Actually, I thought it was a supernova too, but since that was wrong, I, <laughs> I, 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 I thought, saw the 36 and I just went for it without uh, <laughs> seeing the BC. Okay. Uh, hand hand up. Right <laughs> I'll take not astronomy for 100, please. This is the process by which water moves through the earth and atmosphere. James. 
What is precipitation? Incorrect. You notice we're not deducting points when you get an answer wrong, but that's okay. Yeah, bad would be wise. Oh no, should we be? <laughs> I think so. That would be so difficult, wouldn't it? Or yeah. mean? <laughs> uh, <Next> round. <laughs> it, 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 it's a something cycle, but I, I think what it what is a something or other cycle? Incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's pretty obvious. It's called the water cycle. <laughs> Lori is like, come on. <laughs> How could you not get that one with the word water? Well, I, I thought the word water was into it, so it couldn't be that. So, yeah, right. Okay, uh, James, the next question. Oh, I get to ask you, Quinn, again? Okay. Uh, Nobody got the right answer. So, big astro history for 100, please. Called the father of observational astronomy, he made significant advances in astronomy as well as other fields of science. He was called a heretic for promoting heliocentrism, author of dialogue concerning the two chief world systems. James, then Ben. Who is Nicholas Copernicus? Incorrect. No, no, no. It was Galileo. Who was Galileo? Correct. Uh, so he was not. He was not called a heretic for. Promoting hedonism, notice. That was somebody else. That, in, was, in, that was his brother. Incidentally, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems is a great book, and it's quite easy to read. Okay, on to our next question. Hands down first, or lower your... Yeah. Ben? Uh, planets for... No, I'll do stars for... Uh, uh, I guess I don't have any options. I just realized... The the answer that's there, uh, Dennis. I know that. that's not the right answer. That's not the right answer. Closest <laughs> star to the Earth. <laughs> we know, James. What is the sun? I'll take that as a correct I'm answer. Giving it to you. <laughs> I don't, Amy. Where did this come from? Put it up. What no, is, this is that was not the right. Uh oh, fess <laughs> up. That's just the new. Okay, there we go. Oh, dear. Got it. <laughs> I have no idea what that is even. Okay, <laughs> last question. Them. Last question. Planets right. for 100. This is the smallest gas giant. James is first, then Dan, then Ben. Or then. <laughs> yeah, who is Neptune? Correct. In the solar system. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Okay. So as the uh, points stand right now, we have Ben with 2100. Dan with fourteen hundred and James with twenty two hundred in the lead. Oh, so it's not double je It's not a daily double. It's the final Jeopardy. Yeah. Question. So now we'll do the double Jeopardy. So the the way to keep everyone quite honest is: can you in the chat right now put the value that you are going to uh, risk well, out of your? Yeah. How much hmm. are you betting? Uh. And then once everybody says in, I will. Okay, <laughs> James, is like not very much. All right, here we go. You ready? Where do we write the answer? No, I'll ask you. I'll I'll, I'll start Can, with uh, Dan. No, I'll and tell then... the audience. I'll put it up. Should they write it down? Maybe in the. Well, I guess not. No, no, just no, no, just just uh, everybody gets if, if more than one person can get it right. It's okay. Well, no, oh, can... yeah. So write it down, right? In uh, the chat? No, no. I'll ask him. I'm just going to ask. Okay. No, I'm, don't just. I'm okay. just going to ask. We can. Oh, um, well, write it. Yeah. Put it. Yeah. You have to write it down. Can uh, we tell the audience how much they're wagering? No, it's in the chat. Okay. We can, um, we can message Dennis directly with the answer. Send me, yeah, a, so... send me, send me a G, uh, uh, email to Dennis Crab, Dennis Crabtree at gmail.com with your answer. Uh, or just put it in the chat directly to Dennis. No, no, because then they can see each other's answers. So <laughs> no, not if it goes directly to you. Yeah, I wrote yeah. it on a post-it note. I'll, I'll put it up in front of the screen. Send me your emails with with the answer that you think. So Dan, Dan has um, risked 1,399 points. Ben has risked 1,500 points. And James is a conservative 100 points that he has risked. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I haven't got any Everyone answers yet. Everyone can see the question here. Mm -hmm. People emailing me an answer. 
Do you want it to your Gmail account or your NRC? G- account? Gmail account. Okay. <laughs> Why would I be on my NRC email? Just asking. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Saturday night and I'm on my NRC email? No. <laughs> Why? Your, my supervisor is really keeping tabs on me. <laughs> okay. How much time do we give here? I haven't do, got a single do, answer yet, so. I just sent you one. Do, do. Ding, 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 it's ding, open. ding, ding. Okay, Men's I got two in. mails, and I'm just waiting for Dan's. It's, in, uh, it's in the chat directly to you on Zoom. No, it's in the I chat directly in. to me. Okay, so we'll Dan, start with Dan. Uh, what's your answer, Dan? Uh, what's the name of the city in which it's located? Okay. Uh, that is not the correct answer. The correct answer. Um, yeah, but that's, that's I hadn't thought of that, but yeah, that's not the correct answer that I'm looking for. You and I were thinking alike there, Dan. <laughs> Uh, so, so that brings Dan all three down of them. To one point. Okay, all three of them got the same answer, which is, in retrospect, yeah, the obvious answer. But so I have something much more. Well, well, after the water cycle thingy, I thought you. Were... <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, Dennis, tell us the story here. <laughs> okay, so the fellow who the photographer who took all the construction photos of the observatory and did other photography for Plaskett until at least 1932 was Edgar Fleming. Edgar and his brother Harold came to Victoria from London in the late 1880s and opened a photography business. Edgar has a portrait photograph he took of Queen Victoria in national, uh, in, in one of the, uh, archives in the British, in the UK. So Queen Victoria and the DAO are linked by Edgar Fleming, who took portraits of both subjects. What is a history nerd? (laughs) (laughs) That's pretty hard. Well delivered. Uh, The other daily, the other Final Jeopardy question is even harder. Wait, but are we doing this? Are we doing the another board or what do you want to do? Well, who won the, the first game? Well, you did. Oh, what do I What's win? What's the final score? Uh, just wait, because Ben is now, so Dan has one point. I have one dollar. Uh, ben has 600 <laughs> points. And, and James, James has 2,100. 2, it means you're buying your beer afterwards, James. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go. This is fun. Let's do it again. All right. Is anyone yeah, still left online? Can we see if anyone's still left online or have they all quit? <laughs> 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 and we still got 16 participants. <laughs> hey, wow. Okay. Board number go. two. Okay, so I'm trying to remember. Calvin showed me a trick here, but now I can't. Oh, no. Do you want Dan, to Dan, since you finished with the lowest amount, you oh, no. will pick okay. the first question. I think we need to take off points. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. so I can do that. That one doesn't count. Uh, 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 we're all right. right. That's, That's a good idea. I don't know how I messed that up last time. Sorry. That was the practice round. Yeah, I guess that <laughs> for all dissuades people from just going for it. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm sure that'll still happen. Oh, but how yeah. do I? Okay. Okay. I'm sharing my screen. Sorry. Let's... Yay. Okay. Okay, Dan, so... you have the. Honor of picking the first question. The last one I'm concerned, but let, let's go solar system for 300, please. The planets Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus or Neptune are made out of this. Amy, who was first? Uh, James. Uh, what is hydrogen? Oh. Is that right or not? I, I don't have the answers for this one. Oh, yeah. If you scroll down on that email, they, you have them, but it's... Oh, okay. It's like it's part of it, kind of. I don't know, Dennis. Oh, I see them. Yeah, I got you. I got you. Okay. Yeah. Would you... uh, that is not the correct answer. What? Well... Dan. <laughs> what is gas? And? Can we say and? 
and ice core, depending on what uh, you're talking about. Well, I'll take that as a correct answer. I'm not sure ice is really needed. So, yes, we'll give you that. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, James. <laughs> I, I learned from the water cycle. <laughs> there's more than hydrogen. And okay. so there's gas. Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> hey, Dan, pick a question. Uh, solar system for 400, please. Solar system for 400. This planet rotates sideways. Amy, who was first? James. Uh, what is Uranus? Correct. Okay, nice. Okay, I will take stars for 400, please. Major stars become one of these when their star life ends. Um, massive, massive stars become one of these when their star life ends. Who was first, Amy? Uh, James, then, well, Ben took his hand down. So, James. What is a supernova? Correct. Black holes would have also been an acceptable answer. A what? A black hole. A black hole. Okay. Okay, pick a question. Yeah, I'll take uh, moons for 300, please. This planet has the most moons. Uh, Dan, then Ben, then James. What is Jupiter? That's not the answer I have, but I'm going to override what I have and give you a correct answer. Because <laughs> I think that is <laughs> There's a good chance of the person who came up with some of these. Who did came up with these? Did it still well, have Saturn? These I ones. It, I think it's Saturn, actually. Okay, hold on. Oh. Okay, well, Ben was. Uh, can we can we fact check? Calvin, can you fact check? Uh, according to the uh, chat GPT, Jupiter yeah. is the planet with the most known moon. So we'll go with that. What can you, are you can sure you, it's not are you sure it's not Saturn? Yes, yeah, Saturn has 83 moons and uh Jupiter has 92, I think, 95 maybe. Depends which month you ask the question. And right now it's <laughs> we, they yeah. keep finding more, there. so they they go back and forth. Hey okay, Ben, 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 lower your hand. Who's who's getting down boy? Here? Down, down boy, down. Who, who, <laughs> who got this one right? Because now I'm probably confused. I did. Oh. Yeah. Okay. No, James did. James got it right. Oh. I did? What? Okay. He said Jupiter. Okay, back to the questions, please. Didn't Dan say Jupiter? Dan said Jupiter. Yeah. yeah. No. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Dan, go Saturn, ahead. So. Uh, just, uh, just, for, just for reference, James is my boss, so... But, uh, <laughs> Uh, stars for 300, please. <laughs> what is the sound of you getting kicked out of your office, Dennis? <laughs> uh, closest star to the sun. Ben, then Dan, then James. What is Proxima Centauri? Correct. Everyone's on the board again. Finally. Um, I will have um mm. how about um bleh. more astronomy for 300 why is mercury shrinking i'm not sure if you can answer this in the form of a question it's the only one i wasn't quite sure about but okay. james why is the temperature going down Yes, that's correct. It's cooling and then it's shrinking as a result of its cooling. <laughs> well, may I, I ask, that, may I I'm... ask a question? Yes. In the middle of this? Yes. Um, so James, is it the is it the the mean temperature that is that is 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 lowering? Well, because Mercury doesn't have a capital, I thought it was the element Mercury which was in a thermometer, and so it's shrinking when the temperature goes down. <laughs> uh, but the W in Y is capitalized, so... And, and, but also, the, the sub, what was the subject? More astronomy. What does... It, <laughs> anyway, we'll give it to you. It's, you got it kind of right. I thought it was better than miscellaneous. 
Okay. This is definitely the B sides of the Jeopardy. <laughs> Are you referring okay. to the questions or the players? <laughs> well, the first one was great. Okay. Let's for three hundred, please. The, this person is credited with creating a theory of relativity. Oh boy. Amy, who who I, James the Dam the Who is Albert Einstein? You correct. And you even got the pronunciation pretty what nicely. What a, what about Galileo? Oh, poor Galileo! It wasn't Galileo no. invented relativity. No, no, Einstein will win. No, Einstein. Okay, James. Down, he didn't have, down, he didn't have theory in front of his relativity. Okay, I'll take uh, more astronomy for 400, please. The closest star to Earth in Ursa Major, in, Ursa Major, in the constellation Ursa Major. Uh, do I have to answer? Oh, okay, I guess I have. No, you can pass. No, you have to put your hand up. Yeah, oh, you, you know, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, right, right, right. Okay. Hmm. Oh, Dan. What is Alcor? Incorrect. Oh. So Dan goes down 400. I fact checked this one. Just <laughs> uh, deduct points from Dan, please. Oh, yes. Sorry. No, no, no. There we go. Sorry. Okay. Um, who picked the last question? James. James, pick another question. No one's going to guess it? No, because I'll lose points. What's the answer? Oh, Polaris isn't in Ursa. Yeah, Major. it's an Ursa Minor. You think of Ursa Minor? Yeah, I could. <laughs> okay, well, you're gonna have to think like Amy. Uh, okay. give, <laughs> give Dan his points back. But no, even Google said that it. Okay. <laughs> no, because I fact checked this one. Uh, oh man, you must have. Chat GPT must have been lying that day. <laughs> okay. Uh, James, ask a bigger question. Okay, uh, I'll take moons for 400. Jupiter's biggest moon is? James, then Dan, then Ben. Uh, Ganymede. Or what is Ganymede? Correct. Okay, great. Bigger okay. question. Uh, what? Okay, I'll take astronomers for 200, please. This person is cre credited with creating a telescope. <laughs> I knew Ben would be first. <laughs> it was Galileo. No, the answer is Albert Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> That's wrong. You know, Galileo's right. Galileo's right. Galileo. <laughs> he didn't create the telescope. Credited with it. He was the one who pointed it in the sky. He, he yeah. pointed it up. Yeah. And that's yeah, all you have to do to make it. Larry is right, but close there were looking glasses close before that. But not here. This is close enough for Astro Jeopardy. Fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, Ben, pick a question. Let's do um, Oh, Stars for 500. Ooh. Our sun will become this after approximately 5 billion years. James, then Dan, then Ben. Well, what is a red giant? Correct. Okay. It, it's not true. It will become a jolly green giant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Pick a question. Um, I'll take a uh, solar system for 200, please. The first four planets in the solar system made of made up these made up of these. Um, what are the characteristics of the first four planets in the solar system? Ben, then Dan, then James. What are rocks? That's that's fine. I, I'll take that as a correct answer. You know, there's evidence that. They're rocks because a lot of people have those in their heads, so that they had to come from somewhere. I guess so. Okay, pick a question. All right, let's do um, the stars for two hundred. The elements the sun is mostly made up of. Who was first? Uh, ben, then Dan, then James. 
Uh, what is hydrogen and helium? Correct. Next question. Mm, astronomers for 400. Who was the astronomer who first provided the idea of the sun being in the middle instead of the earth? Think before you say his name. <laughs> Dan Ben Ben. Well, I don't like the the first, but who is uh, Nicholas Copernicus? Correct. Um, it was Malcolm in the middle. <laughs> and uh, astronomers. Uh... Lower your hand, please, Dan. Yeah. yeah. Uh, astronomers for 500, please. This person made the law of Hawking radiation. Uh, who is Stephen Hawking? Correct. Next question. Uh, solar system for 500, please. This planet used to have water and trees on it. Dan, it was, then Ben. Uh, I, again, the used to is worrying, but the only one we know has trees is the Earth. So what is the Earth? Yeah. <laughs> Incorrect. Deduct points from Dan, please. Ben, are you going to answer? No, I was going to say that. But I <laughs> is it, said it, so I don't. Because how, how do we know about trees on Mars? The answer I have is, what is Venus? What? Oh, no, I no, thought it was just not. Earth. I know it. I, I'm just, I'm just, a, a, I'm just toasting. I did my have my research team. I trust my research team. You said. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, who got, Dan? Yeah, hands hand down. down. I guess Dan asked the next question too because nobody got that one. Yeah. Uh, uh, moons for 500, please. Saturn's biggest moon is? James, then Dan, then Ben. What is Titan? Correct. Okay. I'll take more astronomy for 200, please. The theory of the Earth being in the center of the solar system was developed by this scientist, Ben. Uh, who was Plato? Incorrect, James. Who is Ptolemy? Incorrect. Deduct points from both of those suckers. <laughs> <laughs> those are good answers. Hands down, please. No answer? No. Yeah. Did you deduct points? Yeah, I did. Not from James. No, I did. I did from both of them. He just but, has too many points. Yeah, he's a lot. Yeah. You, you <laughs> can deduct a few more if you want. Yeah, take 500 <laughs> off. Take five. The hell, man? Is Dad going to get way in there? <laughs> who asked that? Who asked it last question? Who picked the last question? Answer Aristotle. Yes. Aristotle, yes. yes. Hmm. He was Greek, by the way. Okay, who picked the last question? Pick I, again. Was that Ben? Wasn't or James? It was James. I don't think it was me. Okay, I'll pick one. We'll yeah. have moons for 200. The names of Mars's two moons are? James, then Ben, then Dan. Uh, what are Phobos and Deimos? Correct. Okay. Pick yeah. I'll take more astronomy for 100, please. One astronomical unit equals how many miles? James, then Ben, then Dan. What is 93 million miles? Correct. Okay. Sorry. I'll take uh, stars for 100, please. The name of the star that exists in our solar system. Ben, then James, then Dan. What is the sun? Correct. How do you spell that? S-N-U. <laughs> <S -N> <laughs>
Okay, pick a question, please, Ben. Mm -hmm. More astronomy for 500. The black hole in the middle of our uh, the black hole in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy. James, then Dan, then Ben. What is Sagittarius A star? Correct. Okay. You get a gold star for that question. <laughs> Thanks, Good answer. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll take solar system for 100, please. Name all the planets in our solar system in order. Dan, then James, then Ben. What are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune? Correct. I was waiting to see if you had Pluto on there. I, <laughs> I still feel the pain, but I <laughs> moved on. Okay, Dan, pick another question. Uh, astronomers for 100, please. First man to step on the moon. That was fast. Ben, then Dan, then James. Uh, who's Neil Armstrong? Correct. And our final question of the round. Moons. The number of moons Earth has. James, then Dan, then Ben. Uh, what is one? Correct. Actually, it's not true. There's another one called Kruthni, which is a, in a hyperbolic orbit with the Earth. But uh, we won't count it, that. It's it's <laughs> only a, a temporary. It's a yes. visit. It's a visiting moon. Okay, so we have our totals, <laughs> and now we will go to our final Jeopardy question. Um, so first of all, send me a private chat with the amount you want to wager. If you could do that now, please. Uh -huh. No surprise that James is doing the same as the last answer. <laughs> Please uh, let. Okay, let's have the final Jeopardy question, please, Amy. Doing the private chat thing for the answers? Yeah, just again, send me your answer in private chat. Okay, someone has to do the music. Da 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 da. The doo -doo -doo -doo. Like I said, the first one, <laughs> the first question was easy compared to this one. Oh. Are people even aware that there's two small pawns there? Can everyone see the question? Oh. I don't see a lot of typing happening, so I'm worried. <laughs> Dad is saying, <laughs> Okay. Okay. So we'll start with uh, put a, uh, who has the lowest total? I think it's Dan, is it, or Ben? Yeah. So we'll start with Dan. Um, Dan bet 1100, and his answer was J.A. Pierce. Uh, that is incorrect, although J.A. Pierce was the director at the time that the ponds were built. Okay, Ben. Counts, right? And Ben bet 899. And his answer was Dennis Crabtree. <laughs> Not even in the form of a question. Yeah, well, um, how much did I, you I'm a kind of I'm kind of a little pissed off, you know. You're thinking that I'm that old. <laughs> <It was around. laughs> okay. And then James's answer, and he bet one one dollar, one point, as we might have expected. Who is Johnny Small Ponds? Um, no, <laughs> it was James Just Small Ponds. Darn it! No, the correct answer is. I put it up, please. I uh, you know the answer. I don't know. Oh, you don't have the answer. <laughs> um, it's Harry Dukeman. Harry Dukeman. Yep. Who? A little history about Harry. Uh, so he, um, when he retired, they gave him a suitcase as a going away present. I think they wanted to get rid of him. <laughs> uh, but on there, it was uh, it was 
Richard Pierce, it noted there was something about returning to the Channel Islands, to Guernsey. So he originally was from Guernsey. Um, and in Guernsey, his his real his name he was born with was Dukeman, D-U-C-H-E-M-I-N. And he anglicized it to Dukeman uh, when he emigrated to Canada. So he was a fellow that... And you might not notice the ponds, but the first ones on the right, as you take the little steps up the hill towards the, the dome, they're right. It's right there on the right. And the second one is uh, just to the right of the, the circular, semicircular driveway at the White House. So um, I think that one's one of them is, doesn't have water in it anymore. But um, he built those by hand. Uh, I still don't know how they're they really fed with small. water. <laughs> hmm? I've never seen either of them. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Well, there you go. Everybody learned something tonight. Well, well if one of them's I empty, you were making this. My answer is, I thought you were making all this up. <laughs> pond. It's a lot of fun. Is it? Is it still a pond if it's empty? Uh yeah. Is that well, a it was intended to be a pond. <laughs> What is a crater? One from that <laughs> yeah, a right, a hole in the ground. <laughs> so what is a hole in the ground? Anyways, have a look. Next time you're up. Hole in the ground. Well, Thank you to our wonderful game show host and to our contestants. That was that was a lot of fun. Uh, I learned some things, mostly that I need to do a bit more fact checking. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we this makes a return. In a, to another star I would party. Love to, I would love to see this make a return again. Maybe in person would be kind of fun. <laughs> and, and Calvin and I have to completely change our presentations because we've been saying all along that Saturn has more moons than Jupiter. Well, that's what oh, I said. You're totally <laughs> wrong. And I, I, uh, I, I must admit, I never bothered to keep up to date with it. I just thought there was that Saturn had so many more that uh i would i would, would just have to say one has more than the other and then <laughs> that's all i have to say but the thing is they keep discovering more and, and well, so i'd I, love to come back i i could be the ken jennings of astronomy jeopardy <laughs> yeah well, you yes. you definitely won the you're, bragging rights tonight james yes so, you're, um, you're the so champion you defend your title well, yeah. if he didn't, he was going to have to resign as director. <laughs> yes. That's the jeopardy <laughs> part of this game. The jeopardy part. <laughs> And can I just say that NASA has uh, has has uh, websites about the fact that it appears that there were was once ocean and uh, possibly trees on Venus. I did not get it out of nowhere. Na I have, have to take a look. Heard that? That is crazy. Is that yeah. the we'll take a of, look. Is that the <laughs> NASA's Department of Hype? <laughs> That was the idea. Was it the they... April 1st one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, Don? Uh, well, I mean, before before Sagan came up with the explanation that uh, the radio signals from Venus were due to high temperatures, they thought it was uh, they thought it was a, like a swamp planet. Mm. And, uh, hey, a swamp planet. The Edgar Rice Burroughs had. Yeah, there's a band there's called never... Trees on Venus. There's never been life found elsewhere. Hey, we should send Trump there to empty the swamp, to drain the swamp. <laughs> All right. Wow. Thanks, ev thanks everybody. Um, Next time, grow a mustache, Dennis. Pardon me? Next time, grow a mustache for... for oh, the next yes, yes. For Becky and this. Yes. yes. Uh, we're going to just finish off um, tonight. <laughs> With just a, a few um, a few things that uh, uh, we've got Brock uh, Johnson, we've got um, uh, is Dave Payne here, Dave? Yes, Dave. Hi, Dave um, uh, and Dan, um, and uh, they've got some uh, new pictures or some other pictures to show us um, today of gorgeous things up in the sky. I'll give it back over to David and and Dan and Brock. Well, I, I can make this short because I haven't, uh, unlike these two fantastic imagers, had a chance to get out under the night sky and take an image for a good long while here. So I can say thank you to, to the uh, competitors in the Jeopardy game and uh, hand it over. Yeah. Okay. 
I, I guess I'll go. I've got, uh, I might have, the first one might be a rerun, but it's a, uh, it's a good one. So let me share my screen. So wow. as um, I think I might've showed this at our last one, but I'm not sure, but um, uh, back in uh, December on the 15th, we got some reasonably good skies, good seeing, and I was able to actually capture a decent shot of Mars. And uh, I had tried a few times this fall, hoping to catch right at uh, opposition, which I think was on the 8th, but missed opposition, but just by a few days, but um, managed to get some decent detail. And Very nice. I was happy with that one. And then um, on the, uh, when did I, I don't even remember when I did this one. A few, uh, in that same time period, I uh, captured uh, the Bear Claw Nebula, which is a planetary nebula that I had never heard of before. It's very faint, but um, as, as most people know, a planetary nebula is what's the remnants of a star that has basically um, gotten old and expanded um, and um, probably left a white dwarf or something in the center. I don't know if one of those stars is a white dwarf or I don't know much about the actual details of this one, but uh, it does have a little bit of a bear claw appearance in the center. So, and it seems to be surrounded by hydrogen, which is creating some nice red glow. What's, and then- What's causing the lines, Brock? That, I don't know. I mean, it, there's a lot of texture in there that isn't sort of, I guess when you think about it, actually at the, at the heart of the, in the center of the ring nebula, there's actually some little, almost little stripey features. And, and this could be something similar to that, but I don't exactly have any got, idea what would cause it. But then there's kind of a moat around the center, which the dark area separates. the outer Yeah. From it. I thought it was named after the pastry. And then the uh, the most recent one was from January 10th, wow. and that's the uh, what's known as the tadpoles, which is IC410, and it's a nice little star forming region. So there's a collection of young stars in the center here that are blasting out uh, tons of their uh, their energy, which is of course blowing out the surrounding hydrogen gas and probably some oxygen and sulfur. And of course, it's glowing and emanating lots of uh, lots of uh, light in the hydrogen alpha and O3, which hydrogen alpha, of course, is the red, and oxygen is radiating more of a cyan color. And and there's these really interesting little uh, features down here, which is probably where it gets the name the tadpoles mm -hmm. from. But uh, that's, that's beautiful. Think that these are basically caused by another star, a strong magnetic field, or something around stars in this area, which is kind of acting like a bit of a, a shield to the outward gas that's being blown out from these guys in the center, and it's leaving a bit of a wake. And that's all I've got. Gorgeous. Brock. Thank you. Oh my gosh. David? You're on to me. It was a nice Brock. Beautiful, beautiful tadpoles. Um, I, I'm cheating a little bit because I haven't been out since October. So I'm going to show you a set of images I've taken. Uh, I had taken in October where I was frantically taking images and I've pro been processing them when time allows since then. But I was on a bit of a bit of a dust kick, I guess, in in, uh, in October. I was trying to image a lot of dusty things and I'll, I'll show you some of the results here. The first one uh, I think is apropos because it's a, a Messier object. It's, it's Messier's 29th um, cataloged object. Um, the reason I think it's apropos is because he was interested in finding comets 
and then you kept finding these other, other fuzzy things in the sky that weren't moving relative to the other stars. So he decided they weren't comets and uh, catalog all these things so you wouldn't waste your time um, trying to find comets where uh, these objects existed. And I guess if you squint this star cluster, if you squinted at it from a distance, it might look somewhat like a comet. Um, it has a lot of that red hydrogen alpha um, emitting nebulosity, but in and around this star cluster in the middle, it's called the cooling tower because it's lights kind of highlight a, a cooling tower type of shape. But you see on to the left hand side, there's lots of areas that have blotted out the stars behind us. Um, and that's caused by by dust. And, and a lot of this dust um, is why we can't see the whole uh, Milky Way because there's dust blocking a lot of the stars um, as we look towards, towards the Milky Way. Um, another example of dust, uh, an object you might be familiar with, uh, the Pleiades. Um, it's a group of stars that are traveling through a dusty region. So indeed, when there's dust, it appears either black if it's very thick or reddish brown. But where it scatters starlight, um, and this is reflected light, it appears blue. So a lot of times when you're, you're photographing dust, it's, uh, it's uh, basically either light that's been absent or, um, or being scattered uh, and appears blue, just like the, the, the same reason the sky appears blue for us. So this is the Pleiades in, in amongst dust. Sometimes the dust can make interesting shapes. Um, this, is, uh, this is an image of the, the ghost nebula because it looks like ghosts are appearing um, coming out of this, uh, coming out of nothing, I guess, and it has a very ethereal effect, and there's even a kind of a bizarre shape, face-shaped uh, thing in here. Um, here's another um, dust area. This is called the Helping Hand Nebula because it looks like a, a hand is being stretched out, and you can really see that behind that dust, it's really blotting out the, the stars behind it. Um, and then where there are stars um, shining through the dust, you see this very uh, blue halo around them. And then the final dusty image I have um, is kind of a, a bit of a photographic target because it looks like a shark is coming out through space. Again, you can see the blue halos with the stars scattering the, the light and uh, this reddish brown to, to black uh, color where, where the dust exists. So that's all I had for this evening. Beautiful shots. Yeah, those are amazing, Dave. And Thank Rob. you. I have trouble focusing my, my, my iPhone. <laughs> Let alone anything, anything else. Oh my goodness! Thank you, thank you so much, David and Brock. Wow, those are just amazing. Um, I think maybe we'll we'll and there's anybody has any questions or would like to ask any anything of any of our wonderful esteemed guests this evening. Uh, we can take something in the in the uh, in the chat at all. Or else, just um, while you're while um, you're thinking about that, we just want to um, again say thank you to uh, James and to Dan and to Ben for putting themselves out there, uh, and for um, uh, for Dennis for being a, a, a very uh, gracious um, host and Jeopardy a Jeopardy host for us today. And I think it's going to be really fun to see whether or not we can bring back. Um, some uh, some other people, uh, maybe another time. But of course, James will have to, um, you know, 
be one of the champions there to on on the side for sure. Um, please please make sure that you um, that you try to uh, join us for the February the twenty fifth. Um, we're looking forward to Amy uh, giving us some um, historical perspective uh, and uh, Amy. This is kind of part of Black History Month. Is that yeah, yeah, the, yeah whole, that's right. the whole thing? Yeah. I think that's really that's really important that we that we um, pull that whole part in. Would be I'm looking I'm looking forward to that it's a lot. Good, good. Yeah, and hopefully, um, hopefully we'll learn something because I'm learning lots in my research, so it's good. And I would also I'd also like to ask uh, other people that um, we've got a lot of people here that are uh, members of the board of directors and are uh, friends of the the DAO and we uh, we hope that uh, many of you will uh, will uh, continue to help us out and to support us and uh, and uh, be patient until we can get back up on the hill as I said before we can uh, try to get that road back opened again and uh, and we'll see whether or not we can uh, we can be all back up on the hill together which would be just fantastic uh, and we'll just wait a little bit for some better weather too so anybody else have any other things that they'd like to end up with Okay, then we'll say a good night. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks, Calvin, for giving your, your presentation. David, um, Brock, um, Adon, um, and uh, for everybody else, that, that, was, uh, that was a great evening. Really enjoyed it. And I learned some things too. Right. But there is still a couple of things that were wrong there, you know. A couple of things, yeah. I'll have to, have to figure that out. I look next. forward to the It, it really the depends one. on how you interpret them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. Okay. Good night. Bye -bye good night. Good night.